Hello creative entrepreneurs, I'm Katherine McClatchy and this video is going to showcase some highlights from the five episodes in April of Authorpreneurs Unleashed, the podcast. Now, you may not be an author, but the guest that we had on the show shared suggestions, tips, tricks, and experiences that will help you be inspired and encouraged in your business, regardless of what craft you pursue. In episode 34, I sat down with co-producer and audio editor, JoLynn Elkins, and she asked me questions from the community and things that have come up in previous discussions regarding marketing strategy. We look at the, a lot of the outputs of marketing without understanding what goes into creating those things to make them useful. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I would like to talk about. My specialty is digital marketing strategy. I look at the big holistic picture for my clients, but I think, again, one of the biggest mistakes I see is people just don't look into what goes into those posters or into those bookmarks or how to have a cohesive brand to market. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where do we start? So once you've figured out your branding, I would like you to make a list of everybody who's supporting you, your top fans. If you can come up with a hundred people that you consider your diehard fans, that's all you need is a hundred. And if you have more than that, prioritize the top hundred that, uh, and if your mom's on that list, that's okay. You know, if, if mom is your biggest supporter, she needs to be on that list too. And this list of a hundred you're going to know is your VIP. You do all the special things for them. You take care of them first. You create special events. Um, and, and they don't even have to be on Patreon. Uh, it, a lot of authors are moving towards Patreon. A lot of creative entrepreneurs are using Patreon as a tool. I'm, I'm not talking about those folks, although those are wonderful, but these are the people who are talking about you in book club. They're talking about you before Sunday school. They're talking about you at the ballpark um, and, and spreading the message of whatever you create, right? That's your 100 true fans. You need to know who they are. You need to be nice to them and you need to create a survey that they will answer. And if they answer your survey, and it's gonna be a short 10 question survey, if they answer that, then you have confirmed that they are your true fans. And it's, it's nice because they already love you for whatever reason, which I always find interesting. When I was going through my rebranding, I picked out people and asked them these questions personally. Jolyn, you were one of the people. Mm -hmm. I said, what do you see as the core value of what I do? What do you see as the mission of what Unleashing the Next Chapter is about? So we discussed that. And, and the cool thing was I got, of all the people I asked, I got some answers that repeated and I got some answers that were outliers. And when I looked at the repeating answers, I came up with five core values that were not what I had intentionally thought about, but apparently was ingrained into me and my business, right? Mm -hmm. So then I can build a marketing strategy based on those core values. I know what people are finding value in from what I offer. Now this works for businesses. This works for creative entrepreneurs of all stripes. This especially works for authorpreneurs because if you don't know why people love what you're doing, how do you know to market it to a wider audience? One of the first things I need you to think about is your budget. And I know oh. as artists, we hate talking about money, but the fact is, if you consider yourself a professional and you are putting time into your craft and your art, you need to get paid for that. So what expenses have you come up with? Uh, what does it cost you to do what you do, both in time and tools? And, and yeah, writing's cheap. If you have a computer, you can write. But are you paying for Grammarly? Are you paying for other resources? Are you paying for a project management tool? Are you paying to be part of a writing community online or in real life? Are you going to conferences and conventions? 
keep track of all of those expenses, not only for tax purposes, but to figure out your cost of doing business. So then as you're pricing your products or you're setting your goals, you know what you need to be considering, either charging for that product, charging for speaking events, uh, charging for whatever, it also helps you figure out how much you need to invest in advertising, paid advertising. And again, all these platforms are tools. So you have to think about it. You know, everybody knows how to pick up a hammer and hammer a nail. But tell you what, I've watched professional carpenters and they do it differently and way more efficiently. Right. Yeah. They're very fast. Oh, and their my goodness. Aren't even involved. Nope. <laughs> nope. Yeah. So definitely there's a time to get an expert involved if you feel like you're out of your depth or if you feel like it's not worth your time. If your time is better spent doing what only you can do, i.e. writing your books, painting your masterpiece, composing music, you know, whatever it is that you are gifted at and you want to spend your time doing, you need to double down on that. If all of this marketing stuff is just not only out of your comfort zone, but you don't want to take time away from what you know you're good at. Uh, I think it is a wise person that goes and hires somebody else to take over for them or just teaching them. So get somebody in as a consultant or a coach or take a course. There is no sense spending a year figuring out what I could teach you to do in 30 minutes. In episode 35, I sat down with fantasy author Nikolai Weiskel. We were able to discuss Kindle Vela from his perspective as an early adopter, as well as how he uses it as a productivity and marketing tool to create deadlines that he has to meet before the big project is due. I was able to share with him also about Metricool, which is one of my favorite social media management tools. Including such a large portion of the market they would send out an email, make mm -hmm. a post, something, something. You'd think they would do something, nothing. The only way we found out, and this leads into the, one of the best parts about Vela, is the Vela community. People will, if there is a new update, if there is something different, people will post it and spread it around because you sure as hell can't count on, can't count on Amazon, so uh, yeah, we have to depend on each other. How to get on and get started with Kindle Vela. So writers who have never done this before, what are your pieces of wisdom, experience, suggestions to help them have a successful showing? Let me just check my hat to see if there's any uh, secrets. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the backlog is your friend. Writing on a deadline is just like uh, the marathon example I used earlier. Some people can do it. Other people, like me, hate it. Mm. Did I get stuck in that situation? Yes. But and that's why I'm taking longer to release episodes now because I don't want to be in that situation anymore. So I would recommend a minimum of 12 episodes written before you upload it. If you release on a weekly basis, 12 episodes means nine weeks of episodes. So a little over two months. Life happens to all writers. Unless you're a full-time writer, getting up and treating it like, like a work routine life is going to happen so that backlog is your best friend psychologically and just practically absolutely well that's how we do the podcast we record almost a month in advance to where if something happens we still have plenty to upload yeah quick shout out for not for catherine by the way because our scheduling me became a, a hassle that i'm not sure i would have put up with so <laughs> thank, so if you're nervous about reaching out because your life is chaos she will work with you yes i will because my life is chaos too so i extend the grace that i hope others will extend to me 
I'm going to shout out Metricool also. Metricool is a scheduling app. You can get all your analytics. It links up not only your social media, but your blog post, and you can use it the same way you just described. And it's also free. It has a free uh, way of doing that. And you can customize both uh, bars as well as graphics that people can click on. So I use Metricool like you're describing Linktree and I like that it also lets me schedule all my social media from there and I need to double check. I know Twitch is linked up and you can schedule Twitch uploads from Metricool. I haven't seen if Metro, if Bella is on there or not, but that would be interesting. Forget, uh, forget Linktree. I'm going to have to go check out Metricool because that, Metricool. because having a, because having a social media planner definitely has been on my radar, but I don't, I don't write fast enough and I don't make enough money from my writings to justify ongoing expenses. Right. So, uh, so pay... let me just share a little more about Metricool then, since you're interested. Sure. Uh, Metricool, whereas Buffer and Hootsuite used to have a free option. I haven't been on them in years, so they may have changed this, but you could only link like three profiles. So if you were on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, that was it. If you also wanted to do LinkedIn or something else, you had to pay. With Metricool, it's by brand. So hmm. everything under your brand, you can have your Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, um, your blog posts, your Twitch stream, all of these things, you can schedule all of them through that. It has a draft way of doing it. You can look at it from the calendar view. You can look at it on an agenda, what you have going on. It also will tell you the best times to post for your community because it's linked up to see when your followers are on. So then it tells you, you wanna drop your post at this time on this day because that's when the majority of your people are gonna be there. I think that in itself is reason to use it, but it also yeah. gives you all the analytics from all of those and you can look at it as an overall summary of, of all of your stuff and then you can go into just your Facebook or just your TikTok or just your whatever and look at all of that. It also has an inbox. So this is the biggest time saver because I hear people saying they don't want to get on social media because they go down the rabbit hole, something catches their eye, ooh, shiny, and five hours have passed, right? I'm yeah. exaggerating, but, but we've all been there, right? So yeah. having that inbox, all of your messages, comments, likes, all of that, DMs, comes into one inbox from all your profiles and you can just go through them real quick. So I check that inbox three times a day. I don't have to go on the platforms three times a day. I don't get distracted. So, and then, and then the smart links also. So uh, there's a lot of that that is free. It also has some hashtag research for you. Um, I just, I haven't found a better thing. Now I'm on the paid plan because I haven't I heard do of this. a better thing. Yeah. So. And the paid plan, I manage five different brands for, I think it's $19 a month or something, which is ridiculously cheap compared to most of the other plans out there. And most authors are a brand of one unless they have pen names. So Right, exactly. So if you have a couple of pen names or if you have, uh, like um, in my situation, I have my business account, plus I have Authorpreneurs Unleashed, plus I manage other authors and other businesses. So the paid plan, again, is so valuable to me. Um, anyway, there's the not sponsored commercial for Metricool. I'm a big believer. Final summation, would you encourage new authors intermediate authors advanced experienced authors who is this platform for if you are starting out with a writing business because this is connected to the first question that i typically ask people when they come up to me and say do you think i could be a writer i'm like my first question is do you want to write for yourself or do you want to write as a business exactly once you decide and that path forks off when you write for yourself, you can do fan fiction, you can do, you can defy genres, you don't have to care about any of it. Mm -hmm. And you can just write for the joy of writing. But as a business, you have to think about costs, you have to think about how your time is being spent, and you have to look at your numbers. For episode 36, I got to visit with Jennifer Hilt, the author of the Tropes Thesauri series. She writes under multiple genres, 
and multiple pen names and uses tropes to streamline both her writing and her marketing. Okay, so you have obviously been writing for quite a while. Was that something that's just in your genes you've always written or is that a uh, conscious decision as an adult? Yeah. Um, I would say I've always been interested in storytelling, um, read lots of, as a kid and was always like thinking about stories, but I didn't really start writing until I was a young adult, like in my twenties. And it was a real shock for me how difficult it was after years of making up all these stories in my head, I was thinking, oh, I'm just going to be, you know, great at this and, and reading so much. And it was just a huge, huge disappointment when you sit down and you do it to realize, oh, there's like, you know, it's, it's a hard thing to do. There's, you know, some parts that are easier to get into than others, but it's really an accomplishment to like put out a cohesive story. And I didn't, didn't understand that before I began. So that was kind of like my journey. Um, I've been writing for like over 30 years now. And that was really the beginning of my journey as a writer after many, many years of being just a reader and kind of a studier, I guess. That is so uh, so interesting to me because I had a similar experience. I was oh, a, a professor before my strokes and I oh. had years, I, I always loved reading. I loved yeah. telling stories. I had yeah. a vivid imagination. Yeah. And after so many years of teaching literature and analyzing yeah. literature, I thought, oh, now that I can't be a professor anymore, I'll be a writer. Yeah. Cause that'll be easy. Right. Yeah, no, it's a different part of the brain. It, there's yeah. nothing easy about writing. Yeah. So uh, yeah. yeah, kudos to those that it comes naturally to. For me, right. it's it's work. <laughs> yeah, I think like the idea, like, you know, because I had a lot of ideas, mm -hmm. I thought that would be translate into smooth storytelling. And it doesn't, you know, no. it's like everything else. So um, so I totally agree with you because I was like thinking, oh yeah, and then it's a yeah, a whole other thing to learn how to do it. I also love um stand up. Oh I really? Don't do it myself, but I like just love to follow various stand-up comedians and and like just watch how their their stories unfold. Uh -huh. Um and so it's kind of like a I don't know, like a hobby, I guess you'd say. How interesting, because I was actually from my background is literature and marketing. So oh, I have found uh -huh. the happy medium now. I yeah, do book marketing and, and that for others. Uh, yeah. But watching a marketing program last night, they were interviewing a stand-up comedian. And he works his marketing bits and mm -hmm. his storytelling through mm -hmm. stand-up because mm -hmm. that makes for better ads. And I Absolutely. thought, well, isn't yeah. that an interesting thing to think about. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I am not the comedian in the room. I, mm -hmm. I tend to be more serious and studious, but boy, mm -hmm. that was an interesting thought. Yeah. And like, I notice when I'm watching commercials and stuff, cause I'm always thinking about like, why does this work or why doesn't it? It's the ones that are characters and are telling a story as opposed to like buy the thing, you know, buy this mm -hmm. thing or something. And so it's, that makes total sense to me that he would do that. Which is the message I keep trying to get through to authors. If you're using mm -hmm. social media to buy my book, buy my book, buy my yeah. book, you're pushing yeah. people away. You're not mm -hmm. drawing them in. So how do you use the tropes specifically for marketing your books? Because you've got like 24 uh, published books under four right. pen names. And that's oh. another question I want to talk about. So, yeah. so keeping all of that straight and then the marketing of those books to get to the right audience? Yes. Um, first of all, I don't recommend doing uh, multiple pen names at once. That was just kind of like, because I would be like interested in this subgenre and I would want to, to tell the story so that I would do it. But it's like a huge amount of work trying to keep multiple pen names going. In, in so you genres. have pen names per genre? Yes. Okay. Some, um, and it's, at the time, that was the choice I made. Um, I, I wouldn't, I, I think it, it's honestly easier to, when you're starting out, stick to one genre because readers have a better chance of finding you and becoming a fan when you're like producing things they identify with. If you write three books and, and one thing and then you pop to another and some may follow you, but it's just harder on them. Um, and it's harder because we live in a very busy world with a lot of competing things for people's mm -hmm. attention. Um, so the the importance that, especially that we see with, with tropes now is that they are in blurbs. Um, so when you go to Amazon and you read um, really 
any kind of genre fiction, you will see, especially in romance, they're going to be like up, if not in the title, they're often in the subtitle. And it will say, you know, enemies to lovers story or forbidden the title love. of the blurb not the title of the book just to clarify right yes i'm sorry in the in the blurb a lot a lot of times romance authors are calling out what the tropes are because their readers are so savvy okay. but if you read um you know like mystery a, a lot of times there's tropes in there too because i mean we all how many the loner detective right that doesn't right or matter. the locked room mystery or yes. yeah yeah okay exactly so those get used I love locked room mysteries. So like those calling those out in the 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 um, blurb signals to readers, oh, th this it gives them an idea of what you have that they would be interested in, but with your spin on it. So I think the tropes are really important for marketing in this day and age. Yeah, and it also sets up the expectation of the readers because if you mm -hmm. mismarket it, you mm -hmm. end up with a reader who didn't want to read that story. And and oftentimes it's not that they do or don't like it. It's just mm -hmm. expectation and reality didn't connect. Right. So yes. that sets us on edge, right? Yes. Especially right. when we're reading as mm -hmm. a reader, I'm picking a book for a reason because of my mood, because of my yeah. mindset, because I'm okay. on vacation, whatever it is. And if mm -hmm. I don't get what I wanted, mm -hmm. I'm going to be kind of sour about it. Exactly. Yes. And I think it also shows, um, communicates a certain confidence to the reader of like, okay, this isn't just a thing I like dumped out there and you got to sort through and figure it out. You know, I'm mm -hmm. going to take you on this specific journey. And, you know, I think that's what we want, right? We, we want to know that, that this is com a compelling story and that kind of of tightness is something that I, I just noticed like when I personally read blurbs if it's very generic and vague I'm kind of like Neh. no I I'm mentally be writing it in my head you know <laughs> I'm the same way and and authors please understand your blurb is a marketing tool it is mm -hmm. not just exactly. a filler for the back cover exactly yeah and it it takes um you know, writing good blurbs, that's not like a thing that I sit down and dash out. I mean, it'll be a thing I'll work on over a period of days and I, I do multiple drafts. And I mean, it's it's a time consuming thing, but you and you want to share it with other people who are going to tell you the truth and not just mm -hmm. say, oh, that's, you're a genius, um, because that really doesn't help you um, grow or help you find readers. But what you want is a thing that somebody reads it and they're like, oh, I need to read that story like right this minute. Right. And, you you can find I think it's a great exercise to go and read blurbs in your subgenre or if you want yes. to whatever you know just to read them and you get a, an idea of okay this is working why and then you can start thinking why is it working um, I but think it's really we as practice. writers take the blurbs for granted mm -hmm. and it's a very different part of the brain that creates the blurb versus create the story absolutely yep yeah it, it yep. does not come naturally to most writers mm -hmm. the way storytelling right. is often an instinctive thing yeah. blurbing is not yeah. instinctive Episode 37 allowed me to catch up with Tosca Lee, an award-winning and best-selling author of at least 10 novels in various genres, and we discussed the differences between working independently versus collaborating and co-authoring and how that changed her workflow. We also got to unpack, literally unpack, the swag bag goodness that she created for one of her series. When I was planning this month about marketing strategy and writing strategy, she was the first one I thought of because we had the chance to meet at BoucherCon and she handed me a goodie bag. And this was the best marketing thing ever. And it's been, what, <laughs> three years now? And I'm still going nuts over this goodie bag. So we are going to talk about that in depth. But welcome, Tosca Lee. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to chat with you today. Wow. So so what I'm hearing is the process and the strategy is as different as the people involved and the project you're working on. Absolutely. And I, I can tell you that even writing with Ted from book one to book two to book three, the process changed from each book too. So oh, interesting. Yeah, it wasn't the same. So, is that because the books were different or your stages of life were different or you learned yeah. and improved the process? How, how well, did I that think happen? As you adjust to working together, you know, the process can, can change. So 
you know, in the in the first book, I'd take the first run at at most of the first draft, which, as you know, is not my favorite. But anyway, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so and then in the second book, we were both drafting. And in the third book, he started taking the first run at most of the drafts. So and the other person would rewrite. So we'd rewrite and pass it back and forth. And with the first book, Forbidden, I don't know how many times we re rewrote each other just because we were trying to get a single voice, but it could have been 20 or more that we rewrote. Oh over one another on that book so yeah, yeah. by the third book you know we had the voice down we wrote it in probably two months it was that's amazing yeah, it was insane yeah but the first book took forever it took way longer than it would have taken to write a book by ourselves you know because so. you were figuring out each other's work style and strengths and yeah. weaknesses and how to compensate I'm sure yeah. um I'm, I'm just processing that because yeah that's that's a big commitment that you take on when you're working with somebody else and i know when i'm working where somebody else is waiting on me for the next step that's its own stressor so yeah. how do you make that work in your daily life and with the ocd and all the things um <laughs> did, did did that yeah. require an extra level of flexibility and grace or did you find that that actually helped you focus and get it done well, I, I've been blessed most of my life, and this could be changing a little bit now these days, but I've been blessed most of my life with a very keen sense of focus. So once mm. I dig into something, um, you know, I don't multitask well. So I know that when I start a book that I'm going to start dropping balls everywhere else. You know, I, I will forget to pay bills. I'll forget my my inbox will explode and I won't get back to anybody. And, you know, these because I, I can only do one thing well. Um so there's that when I wrote with Ted, you know, he he's a man who had kids still at home. So he was working during the day and I was writing at night. So, you know, I'd write my stuff and he'd be reading it in the morning and then I'd resurrect around noon. And, you know, then we could talk about the stuff um, with Marcus. Um, you know, Marcus is one of the most um open-handed generous you know authors as far as authors go because he basically said here you go um take a run at it <laughs> you know and I was and he might not hear from me for months um and we ha we didn't know if we would end up with something that was um going to be wanted or get picked up or you know what I mean we hoped so uh, we both have good track records but we didn't know and there was a time it was like, well, I don't know, do we put this on the back shelf? Do we, um, was this just a great learning experience? And I, I remember thinking, we've put so many years into this. No, that's, we're not going to do it. We're going we're to find a home for this. And, and luckily, you know, we, we just, we just got a beautiful starred review from Publishers Weekly and a beautiful starred review from Booklist. And I told Marcus now, if Kirkus likes this, because they normally hate me, if Kirkus likes this, put your white robe on because the end is near. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so you put, I'm, I'm just processing, you put five years into this project that he had already been collecting research on for however many years before that. Mm -hmm. And you still released two books during that time. Let's talk about how you came up with that go goodie bag. Um, <laughs> because I just think that was brilliant. And I've still got the bag hanging behind me. I should have pulled it down to, to show. May in fact, hold on. Yeah, I want to see the bag. <laughs> so, uh, since we're doing this. <laughs> yeah, the save the bacon bag. Yeah, hold on. I'm going to turn off the oh, there background. Can you see it now? Oh, yeah. There you go. Right there. Yep. Save, save the, the bacon. Save the world. And I got the straps on. So, when I first got this, I'm like, <laughs> what on earth? And then inside, I still have a couple of the things inside, um, you put in, and, and when I saw it, you had one of those uh, little safety uh, blanket things in a packet. You had the a little flare. mylar blanket. Yeah, you had a, uh, um, a like military-grade meal pack. You had some uh, vegan recipes. You had uh, just such an eclectic mix of things. And I'm like, <laughs> what? is this about and and so i i got the bag before i started reading the book and i dumped it all out in my hotel room and i'm like 
this makes no sense. It's such a disparate group of items. <laughs> what the heck? Oh, there was a, a quarantine sticker, which ended up on my previous laptop. I covered the lid with stickers. All these things. But the fun was, as I'm reading the book, I'm going, oh, that's yeah. why that's in there. Oh, that's why that's in there. <laughs> and it was just such a fun thing. So I'm guessing not everybody got the goodie bag. So how did yeah. you use that? And and follow up questions already. Not only how did you use it and who got it, but I'm guessing those were expensive to put together. Was it worth the cost? Did you feel like um, the investment was returned in book sales or promotion? How, how did that all work? Yeah, so... I got the idea because from bookstagram basically so i'm okay. looking at instagram i'm looking at the way that people are um displaying books with items that kind of go with the book um i've seen swag bags before that have some goodies like you know bookmarks and you know maybe a pin or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sometimes even a t-shirt or whatever and for me this was just a really fun way to to say what can I equip, you know, some of these uh, book influencers with? And, and I spent days and weeks just emailing them saying, hey, I have a new book coming out. Uh, can I send you a copy? Uh, and I did this for uh, The Line Between and A Single Life. And the Line Between, by the way, so save the bacon, save the world. Uh, bacon plays into the storyline because the right. disease enters. I, I wasn't going to give that away in case somebody hasn't written oh, it. No okay. spoilers. <laughs> but also, you know, my my readers know I have a love affair with bacon. And so okay. it's not uncommon for them to bring me sometimes like bacon themed gifts. And so it's it's kind of a, a it was kind of a, a behind the scenes joke with my readers, you know, who know I love bacon. And I'm vegan. So when I walked in the house with this bag, my husband's like, wait, what, what happened what? to you at that conference? <laughs> yeah. So sorry, vegans everywhere. Um, and I understand the vegan bacon is avocado, which I also love. So I had a vegan tell me that and I'm like, Hey, I'm all for avocado. Right. Right. We can make it work. Yeah. That, we can make it work. And also Morningstar Farms has a really good yes. vegan bacon that I have eaten. Even yes. though I'm a meat eater, I still eat vegan food because I like it. So, But anyway, I, I wanted to give the the bookstagram community that the ones that chose to, to take my book and read it and possibly review it and feature it, I wanted to give them some fun things. So that's what happened. And it's funny because when the pandemic happened, we actually, and, you know, you couldn't find like hand sanitizer, mm -hmm. masks, all this stuff. We had masks because we'd been throwing surgical masks in a yeah. lot of the bags. Yeah. And so we just happened to have some left over, but it was very weird. But we had a, a really great time doing that with um, that book and the sequel. Um, yeah, vegan recipes. I, I mentioned this vegan egg salad that has chickpeas in it instead of eggs. Right. Book, so we put the recipe in there. I actually made actually it and it was very good. <laughs> it is very good. I've had it. Yeah. It was, so it was, it was just fun. Was it worth it? I don't know. Different concept. Yeah. Different. And, but was it, you know, was it was expensive and mailing is expensive and you get the tote bags made and you curate. I mean, it was fun for me to curate all this random stuff. Mm -hmm. was it, it it's really hard to measure and and I I don't know if I could put a measurement on it but the fact that it was fun the fact that I did get quite a lot of good bookstagram coverage um was super helpful so did it add up to the dollars I spent I don't know episode number 38 finished out the month of April and we were able to talk with paranormal romance and mystery author Amanda Arista, who is also a writing instructor. But the big takeaway from that interview was how she changed careers and did it while raising a growing family. Amanda, welcome to Authorpreneurs Unleashed. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Okay, so I know about you and the bean and all the things and i've pet your dogs but for those who don't know you can you kind of tell us a little bit about um how you got here your your how your day job and your education and all your things make you the amazing writer you are yeah so i i mean just a little kind of life story background i have been writing my entire life 
since like third grade. I've always done it as kind of a side hobby, that thing you do in the dark at night underneath the sheets with a flashlight and like a spiral. <laughs> Um, making up these funny little universes of, um, you know, like witches and magic and very influenced by C.S. Lewis and unfortunately a lot of Star Trek, probably at one point. I'm okay with um, Star Trek. I understand yeah. those analogies. Right. Well, and it's, and it's, and it's fun to sort of like embrace the fact that like, no, 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 trust me, everyone starts with fanfic. And, and there's a, there's a structural reason why everyone starts with fanfic. Thank you for pointing that out because I was under the sheets rewriting Trixie Belden and Nancy Drew. So right. That's right. where I went. Yeah, like everyone starts as an OC on a on an already established world. Um but yeah, and so I but I always did it as a hobby. It was always something I did on the side. And so, you know, you, you go through middle school and you go through high school and you get to college and you realize, oh, okay, well, I'm good at English, but I'm not good enough to be a writer. But I'm good at English and I'm good at teaching, so I'll get a degree in education, I'll get a degree in psychology, move on and get what I like to call the retirement job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And kind of hit, you know, the real world where you have to actually like have a day job of eight to five because you like this thing called food and a roof over your head and you want to buy a house so you can have a backyard to put a dog in. And the kid um, needs shoes at some point. Right, exactly. The kid needs shoes, you know, and um, I just got to a point in my career where I was kind of stagnating, but I had always, always done writing on the side. And so my husband, because he is extremely in tune with the craziness that is Amanda, kind of gave me an ultimatum. He's like, you need something new. You need to do something new. I think you should either write this book that you keep talking about, that you keep like spending so much money at a Home Depot or at Office Depot buying spirals for, or go get a master's degree or something and get a new job because you're not happy. So you need to do something that makes you happy. And so that's when I started really actively pursuing writing as not just a thing that I did by myself mm -hmm. underneath the covers or like, you know, curled up on the weekends, um, you know, at a coffee shop. It, it, that was the moment in my life where I was like, oh, this is something within you. This is a storytelling need that I have. And so I took my first class and discovered there was a whole plethora of other people that also had this storytelling need. And that's when I really fell into the writer's path at SMU. I found all the amazing writers groups here in North Texas. Um, and then that's when I really started pursuing this whole, you know, getting published. And, oh, my gosh, there's somebody out there that wants to read this crazy story about this girl that changes into a panther. Like, but it really was kind of a moment in my life where I was like, I needed to do something that made me happy. And I hadn't realized that was the release that I needed. It wasn't just accepting that I was a writer. It was accepting it and then finding a couple other people who were like, hey, I'm your same kind of weird. And now I feel like I'm a weird guru. So, so that's kind of how I got started. Yeah, I just. And, and it's interesting. So did you keep the day job or did you change that too? I ended up um, very shortly after changing the day job into something that was completely and utterly tailored for me. But I think it came along with the realization of, hey, you need this you 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 have this storytelling drive within you and you need to fulfill that but you also cannot absolutely be boxed into a nine to five that's going to look like the same thing mm -hmm. for the next mm -hmm. 27 years like i need creativity in my day job as well and so it was kind of interesting that as soon as i kind of started taking classes and i got my first publishing contract i also changed my day job into something that was much more creative and kind of flowed in with my natural talents um, and it was basically designing this brand new portion of medical school curriculum that had never been done before. So that is amazing. Yeah. So, so you're writing during the day, but curriculum writing is very different from it is fiction yeah. writing. Yeah. Curriculum I... writing, there was program coordination. No one had ever really put a program like this together before. So it was a lot of, I think while I was, you know, reading things like, writing the breakout novel by Donald Mass, I was also at work reading policies and procedures and all the, you know, the legal ease of how to hire students and how medical student school works and how this, all this other stuff. So it was really kind of fun to kind of be able to, I don't know, just, just kind of grow in both aspects at the same time in completely tangential directions. Like one right. was definitely like, how big of magic can we get? And the other one was like, okay, so 
if I do this on this one spreadsheet, on this one form, how does it impact six, six or seven steps down the road? Um, and so it, it's funny that I have like that, I don't know, that whatever brain that is that kind of does that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it kind of, it all clicked about the same time. I started really getting into my writing about the same time I started literally plotting out the, my dream job, what I'm, which I'm still at after 10 years. I hope you enjoyed this recap. If you're interested in any of the authors that you heard speak or in listening to the entire episodes of the podcast, all the links will be in the description box below. If you stayed with me through the entire video, thank you so much. I really appreciate you listening. As I'm just starting this channel, I hope you'll give me some feedback. Drop a note in the comments. Let me know what you liked, maybe what you didn't like, what you're interested in learning more about, and how we can improve. Be sure to subscribe for more fantastic content specifically designed for creative entrepreneurs like you. Thanks for watching. Until next time, keep creating and keep learning by doing.